411 Live. Where you can learn about issues that affect us every day. Stay the world. 411 Live. Real people, real talk. Made to help people in our community in every way. For your girl. Hello and welcome to the 411 Live. Real people, real talk. I'm Beverly Taylor. The 411 Live is committed to spreading awareness about human trafficking, specifically sex trafficking. We do that with podcasts and we have other programs as well. We want to keep it in the forefront of people's minds. A lot of times I start these projects, these podcasts, and I say that human trafficking and sex trafficking is hidden in plain sight. Sometimes that even includes the doctor's office. Joining me now, we have two really special guests. Dr. Angela Rabbit, Associate Professor of Pediatrics at the Medical College of Wisconsin and part of the Child Advocacy and Protection Services at Children's Hospital. We also have Dr. Wendy Ehrman, and she is also an Associate Professor of Pediatrics and an Adolescent Medicine Specialist. All right. So, ladies... Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Now, during the podcast, I want to welcome all of you and encourage all of you to respond. Um, send us your questions, your messages, your suggestions. And we really want to read those, and we really want you to be part of this conversation. And full disclosure, when I was working for Fox 6 as an anchor reporter, I did a report with Dr. Angela Rabbit. And as a matter of fact, that story was Emmy nominated. Really? It was. Did you know that? I, I had no idea. It was. It sure was. Um, so we've talked about things, but this gives us a chance to expand on what, you know, we couldn't say in that short amount of time of a news report. Right. So it's just exciting to me to have you here. And of course, Wendy, I thank you for joining us. Wendy is here, and she just had a little medical uh, treatment, but she still came. So that is commitment, and we thank you for that. Yeah, and I apologize if I'm slurring any words. (laughs) Perfectly acceptable. Perfectly acceptable. (laughs) Let's start. You know, in the report that I did, we were talking about the study that you had recently done with physicians, you know, looking at their awareness of sex trafficking and, you know, are they probing, are they looking for it, that kind of thing. Kind of tell me about that study. Yeah. So the study was done uh, several years ago back in around 2015. Mm -hmm. Uh, And around that time, you know, for the uh, previous two years or so, our section was really, we were trying to educate ourselves about sex trafficking. When I first started at the Medical College and Children's Hospital in 2009, it was not on the radar at all. You know, every once in a while we'd see someone come in, uh, usually with law enforcement, Mm -hmm. and they would be described as a juvenile prostitute, which is kind of how they were described back then. And of course, with, you know, my, with my training, and we recognized that this was exploitation and this was not prostitution. But we, I don't think, really understood what was going on. As we started learning more about that, it kind of became apparent that uh, we weren't the only ones that didn't know. So we wanted to get a feel for uh, what other providers knew and their comfort level in providing medical care for this population. So we did a survey, and this was uh, sent to medical providers, which includes doctors, nurses, uh, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, uh, and we also sent the survey to social workers that work in a medical setting. Okay. Uh, this was all over Wisconsin, and we tried to focus on uh, areas that we thought would be seeing people who are trafficked. So emergency departments, urgent care centers, uh, reproductive health care centers, places like that. And the survey uh, asked about knowledge about sex trafficking and uh, comfort level and confidence in caring for for people who are trafficked. What we found was kind of what we expected. Less than half were able to identify someone as a trafficking victim in clinical vignettes that clearly described them as a victim of trafficking. 
Uh, they were given all the clues. Yeah, that they clearly met the definition, yeah. um, but they uh, were often described as a child sexual abuse victim rather than sex trafficking. And in 10% of the cases, they were described as a prostitute, uh, which was, mm. was kind of interesting. And we also found that the vast majority, as we suspected, didn't feel confident, 90% didn't feel confident in their, in their ability to, pro to provide appropriate medical care for wow. that group. So, but they were very, very interested in learning more. 95% wanted to know more about it and kind of recognized their limitations. So that was uh, the beginning for me. Uh, Wendy had already been really working on it. Uh, go ahead. Well, we, I've worked at the juvenile detention center now for a long time, and a number of years ago, the nurse practitioner I was working with kind of noticed, and I noticed that there was a lot of, in, probably mostly young women, although this is a problem of young men too, who we were concerned about might have been involved in, in sex trafficking. They just had a lot of uh, history that was similar, and we started getting some that would actually tell us that they were involved in sex trafficking. So we also started talking to other people um, at the juvenile detention center, including a district attorney, um, some victim advocates, uh, mental health, HMO, wraparound Milwaukee. Um, many people probably have heard of Claudine O'Leary. And we worked together on a project to try to help coordinate services for youth who'd been um, acknowledged or at high risk for being trafficked. And that's kind of how I started, although I can tell you that I've been seeing these victims for years. Really? Yeah. It's just mm. like Angie said, I just didn't recognize it. And when I thought I was recognizing, I didn't know what to do. Nobody ever taught me how to approach or, or how to deal with victims of sex trafficking. Okay. So they say, we want to know. We, don't, we want to know more. We want that awareness. Are you seeing a change? Is there a shift? I think there is a shift, and it's slow. You know, uh, education, changing culture and people's mindsets always takes time. Mm -hmm. But uh, one of the things that, that we did as part of the project Wendy was talking about, this was the POSI project. POSI was Proactive Outreach for the Health of Sexually Exploited Youth. Okay. That was kind of our first mm. project. We developed some guidelines for uh, medical providers at Children's Hospital of Wisconsin, which is now Children's Wisconsin. <laughs> They're changing their branding uh, so that they had some steps that, that they could take. And we also focused a lot on education. We did a lot of talks, a lot of lectures, a lot of trainings. Yeah, yeah. So those guidelines, is it a kind of a step-by-step -step thing or uh, a list of what to look for or— it's, it's both. Uh, it's combined with our sexual assault guidelines mm -hmm. at Children's Hospital. Uh, it, it talks about some risk factors, things, indicators, things you might see. Uh, it talks about how to ask the questions, how to screen, and then uh, some of the differences that you might consider in the medical treatment for someone who's trafficked versus someone who comes in for a sexual assault evaluation, mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, where you might refer them for community resources. And advocacy is a, a big part of it, too. So it, it directs providers how to find an advocate for that youth. That's important. Very important. Um, and this is a really simplistic question, but why do you think physicians are so vital in this equation of finding sex trafficked victims? Because somebody who these youth see on a frequent, hopefully, regular basis should be able to identify them. Sometimes youth will feel more comfortable reaching out and talking to a physician. And so physicians have to be able to start the conversation. And it might not be something that's identified at the first meeting or the first visit with the youth. And it may take a couple of times because this is a matter of trust. The youth has to trust you. But you can do something about it. So that's what's really important here. Right, right. So... Um, Part of the report that we did, I had you kind of go through that conversation that you would have with that young person who came into your office. You started off by telling me one of the first things that you do is get that young person by themselves. Mm -hmm. Is that still yes, critical? That's, yes, for both youth and adults, I think trying to talk to them privately is important. They may be there with the trafficker. The trafficker might be in the, the waiting room. Um, 
and they're not going to feel comfortable, obviously, right. talking about it in front of someone else. So I think for both Wendy and I, that's part of our standard uh, evaluation for adolescents anyway, uh, that they would we would speak to them privately. One of the more surprising things that you said, too, was this includes the parents. Yes, sometimes it does. Yeah. And you were saying sometimes they are the trafficker. Yes. Mm-hmm. That's alarming. Yeah. I think there was a case, um, Operation Cross Country, which um, is a, a law enforcement uh, operation that occurs uh, every year where they try to get youth off the street who mm-hmm. are being exploited and, and prosecute, pick up and prosecute the traffickers. Um, I think two years ago, they picked up um, two young uh, teens who were being trafficked by their mother in Racine. I think I remember that. Yeah. See, that's amazing to me. Mm-hmm. It, it really is amazing. Um, I want to um, get you guys to kind of go through some of the questions and that you would, you know, offer to the patient, young patient that comes through. But we're close to a break, so let's just go ahead and take that break right now. And when we come back, we will continue to talk about this. So stay with us. We'll be right back. Human trafficking is a global issue that is happening locally. This is a problem that we cannot ignore. Being so scared on that hotel bed and wish I had my mommy. Going back into that feeling of, man, what what am I getting myself into? She rests her head on the prison to which she's chained. I'm standing there and I can't move. I can't go nowhere, I'm stuck. Drug into this spider's web and she can't untangle herself to freedom. Him telling me how pretty I am and what I what I can do to trick guys out of money and where I what I need to do and how much money I need to bring back and him take him making me change into different lingerie to take pictures of me to put me on Craigslist. Now I'm a product to be sold. Beneath this ground we walk is a hill of movement in a forced direction. Gridlocked, traffic lights, sex. Currency, bodies, stock, fear, monopolized, auction, blocks. Another job, he coming up and he coming up and then just being sold over and over and over and over. Minds groomed to be immune to pain. And you used to it and you just lay there. Numb, desensitized, <laughs> innocence, drain. I went from that, that scared little girl from the foster care, from being molested by my stepbrother, by my foster brother. To, uh, to being a lonely little girl stuck in a house, so scared with my mother, to being trafficked. Welcome back to the 411 Live, Real People, Real Talk. We are talking to two physicians right now, and the topic is how to recognize sex trafficking in the midst of medical care. Dr. Rabbit and Dr. Ehrman both have dealt extensively in this field. You guys came up with some guidelines, uh, questions that physicians, healthcare providers can ask patients that come in. And I just wanted to get a sense from you what what this conversation would be like. You know, I know it's kind of a delicate ba- uh, balance. You're not going in and saying, oh, are you sex trafficked? You know. <laughs> so how, w- what does that conversation look like? Well, I think one important thing to remember is that uh, you can't tell just by looking at someone or even by someone's history, past, whether they're being trafficked or not, because it can look like so many different things. Um And even though there are some risk factors that make people more likely to be trafficked, when you've actually got someone sitting there, none of that really matters because, like I said, there's really no face to it. So it's important to do – to talk about uh, violence in relationships and uh, things things like that 
really at every medical visit. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that we've heard a lot from survivors, too, is that that should be a part of every medical visit that you have. There should be those basic screening questions, and they sh they should be asked at every every visit. Mm -hmm. uh, so things like, uh, do you have a place to stay ton tonight? Are you or are you worried about where you're going to stay tonight or in the, in the future? Uh, or do you feel safe where you're staying right now and with the people that that you're with? Very basic questions that right. kind of open the door. And if you ask those to everybody, it doesn't seem like this person is being singled out. Right. And right. there's a little more of that kind of trust being built. Yeah. And then if you're – another good question. Um, has anyone tried to uh, keep money that you should have been paid for work that you've done or services that you've provided is a, a great question that would get at both uh, labor trafficking and sex trafficking. Mm -hmm. But people don't think to, to ask things like that. And then if you're getting kind of a feeling that there's something going on, then just then keep asking those questions, um, but not pushing. Yeah. Because there might be reasons they're not able to tell you at that moment. Uh, and and trying to force it out of them is just not is not a smart idea. Yeah. Is there a, a do you have a stream of questions that you like to ask? Yeah, and I see, I should just say, qualify, I see a lot of youth are, who are in out-of-home placement, so who come from um, shelters or group homes or residential treatment centers, they already have some high-risk factors. And a lot of the youth that I've seen, especially at the detention center, have run away one or more times, so I can taper my questions a little bit more. And for those youth, for instance, that have a history of running away, I'll kind of ask them like who they've stayed with or when they've been on the run, you know, have they ever had to do anything to get a safe place to stay or just to get food and were they ever forced to do anything or did they ever do anything they didn't want to because they had to get like, for instance, a place to stay. How forthcoming are they? Um, it depends, but uh, I would say like at the detention center, if I come across as a safe person and I tell them right off the bat that I'm not there to get them in trouble and I'm just trying to help them, oftentimes I can get some information from them. It may come gradually, but if they trust you and they know that you really are there to help you help them, then sometimes I can get that right off the bat. That's key, trust. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very it really key. Is. And one, one important part about that trust is telling them what we're allowed to keep yeah. private and what we would have to tell someone else. So as mandated reporters, we do have to report sex trafficking for minors. And so uh, before we even, I even start asking sensitive questions, I'll, I'll tell them those that. Full disclosure. Full disclosure. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. These are the things I can keep private, but there are some things you could tell me and I, I would have to report it. Okay. You were also, so I, I think uh, when we talked before, you were talking about how sometimes you get to it in a roundabout way, especially with teenagers. You know, do you have any friends mm -hmm. that you've seen? Do yeah. You, this or that. Yeah. I, you don't just come out and ask, are you being trafficked? Because especially mm, youth, yeah. they don't know what that means or they don't identify what's happening to them as trafficking. So describing it more in in language that they would relate to. Uh, and so some of, we've talked to both youth and adults about how they would want to be asked. And one of the things we often recommend, like if you're looking for specific wording examples is, uh, you know, some people tell us that they um, do sexual things for uh, money or a place to stay or other things that they might need, or they say that someone has forced them to do things like that. Is, have you ever heard of that? You just start out uh, just bringing it up, like, mm -hmm. is this something that you've heard of? And that that opens a door. So even if it's not safe for them to tell you what's happening at that moment, you can start a conversation about what resources might be available. Right. Have you been surprised by um, people, especially young people, actually saying, yeah, that's me? Does that happen? I, I would think it would happen more, you would see it more, at the juvenile detention center. Yeah, I don't think they don't come out and say like I've been trafficked, but you know they may agree that perhaps that they were given money um, to do a sexual act for somebody. Mm -hmm. So that's more how it comes out, or or that they had to do something because they needed a place to stay, so they slept with somebody just so they were safe. Right, right. 
with the uh, going back to the whole thing with the study, are you as you talk to physicians, are they feeling a little more comfortable? One thing you said I think that was key is having these questions and just asking everybody. Mm-hmm. So then it's just it's you know it's routine, mm-hmm. but I was just wondering, you know, are you still getting that where they say, well, I'm just kind of I feel a little uneasy asking, blah blah blah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's always going to be an issue. You know, in many of the hospitals, there are new people coming in all the time. We have Mm -hmm. residents and medical students and learners. Uh, And so, and and this isn't a routine part of medical education. Right. Uh, You don't just come out of medical school knowing how to have these sensitive conversations. So, um, yeah, not everyone feels comfortable. I think there's a lot more comfort with it now than there was. I'm getting... Uh, that feedback from people, especially in the emergency department at Children's Hospital, and I'm seeing when we look at those cases that they're they're doing the right things. So we're definitely making progress, mm-hmm. but getting this education into uh, basic medical education and nursing education is still something we want to work on. And when you say that, that's in terms of medical school, you know, mm-hmm. and nursing schools. and nursing school, making yeah. that part of the curricula. Yes. Or actually all medical personnel would like it to be, even from, you know, the person who checks somebody in the front desk should know the warning signs, not just the doctors and the nurses mm-hmm. and the PAs, mm-hmm. but everybody who works there should have mm-hmm. some idea of what, what to look for. And paramedics. Yeah. And EMS, yeah. first responders. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. When you tell them... Um, I know you're, you've got the guidelines on the questions that they should ask, but when you talk to folks to say what to look for, because you were saying, you know, people can look anyway and be a victim. So what do you tell them as far as what to look for? I think it's important to understand what the the risk factors are. Mm-hmm. I mean, for youth, probably the most important risk factor we've seen, I don't know if you want to talk about the study oh, that you sure. worked on, but uh, homelessness, runaway behaviors mm-hmm. is number one uh, risk factor. Yeah. And in that homeless population, about 20 to 40 percent is made up of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and questioning youth. And they're especially high risk for this due to, you know, just discrimination and the whole reason that they're part of the homeless population oftentimes because they're not safe at home, they're discriminated against. But that's just one thing that we see. I think there's lots of risk factors, both physical things we see and also in their social histories. So things such as a history of sexual abuse. Um, running away, being an out-of-home placement. One of the things we saw, I I had done basically a study looking at a bunch of youth that we had seen in a one-year period of time who either were recognized as being trafficked or highly suspected Mm -hmm. suspected of being trafficked. And there's a couple of things that really stood out, Um, lots of mental health diagnoses. And one of the ones that surprised me was uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Lots of these youth were diagnosed with that. And I think we've come to the conclusion that probably what we're seeing is a lot of kids that were suffering from trauma and post-traumatic stress disorder that can have some of the same signs and symptoms as ADHD. And a lot of the youth that I came to know have had trauma early on, whether it was sexual abuse, neglect, or physical abuse. And I, I suspect that they were labeled as ADHD when the trauma signs weren't recognized. Wow. Because it manifests itself yeah. kind of very similar. Yeah. Okay. Wow. So when I think of ADHD, I think of um, kind of bouncing off the wall. Mm-hmm. Um, what are you seeing when you say that, the AD, the similar signs? Kind of the hypervigilance, yeah. you know, just, you know, Impulse, rea- the way the, yeah, impulsivity, problems. yeah, reacting, overreacting mm-hmm. situations, things like that. Yeah. Have you had run into some cases that I I know my my husband was a paramedic and there are you know he goes through the routine all the time but there are just those few cases that just really stick with him. What about you guys? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. I mean there's cases. I think what I the cases some of the cases that I remember are things that I saw before I started doing this work that were right in front of my eyes. And I that had hidden it, in plain sight. Yeah, thing. yeah. And I and I saw it. I suspected it. I didn't know what to do. 
So, and, and actually, to be honest with you, I have met some of my former patients and some former parents who have come out as being uh, survivors. And that's always, that's hard because you recognize it and you're like, you know, the signs were all there. I just didn't put it all together, didn't know what to do. Yeah. Yeah. I think that uh, one case that really sticks out for me was actually the, the pa- my patient wasn't the victim of trafficking. It was my patient's mother. And uh, I was seeing the, the patient because of physical abuse uh, by what, you know, we thought was mom's boyfriend at the time. And we learned later was actually her trafficker. And he was hurting the, the children to oh, keep to control, control over mm-hmm. her. And that really um, hit home for me. Just, you know, some people will say, well, it's their choice that well, if she wanted to get out, she could, she could just leave. Uh, but that was just a, a glaring example. She didn't feel like she had a choice. She right. was terrified. Wow. Yeah. So, yeah. So it was the kid. Yeah. That was being beaten by the trafficker. Right. To take control of the mom. Right. I guess you hear a lot of stories like this. Um. And I guess since you guys have kind of educated yourself and you've had this experience, people are more likely to trust you because you know how to talk to them and you are empathetic to them. Is that a true statement, do you think? Or I hope so. Yeah, I hope so, too. I think getting to know somebody and one of your patients and letting them know. I think even asking the question, a lot of times you're not going to get a positive response right away. And I'm talking more at the med- my medical clinic. Um, I think it's a matter of seeing them over and keep asking the questions and letting them know that you're there, that, you know, not pushing them more than they want to reveal. And I think I've had several cases where things come out later on when the person is ready to start disclosing or when they need something. Yeah. Yeah. So once a physician has gone through, you know, the questions and everything, and they've pinpointed that, yes, this is um, a victim of sex trafficking, then what do you do? Well, if I find them in my office, one of the the things that I do, or even, or actually I should say in the juvenile detention center too, uh, we have a great advocacy group in Milwaukee right now. Um, There's a number of organizations that have advocates, including Pathfinders, um, UMOS, Sojourner, and then there's a grassroots group that's made up of all people from all those agencies called CRAE, Collaborative Response Advocacy. Collaborative Rapid Rapid Advocacy for Youth. Yes, I always say that (laughs) stuff. Um, but it's a grassroots organization of members from all of those organizations that volunteer their time to go out and provide advocacy to um, youth who've been trafficked um, in emergency rooms or clinics or wherever. Wow, that's great. Do yeah. we still have um, kind of the roaming van that goes out? Do you, are any agencies Street do beat? Have, Yeah. I think uh, that was run through Pathfinders, and I think they still do. Okay, okay. Yeah, so uh, also because we're mandated reporters mm-hmm. in youth, we we have to call uh, law enforcement and child protective mm-hmm. services. So that, that's part of it. Uh, but we've also, as part of POSI, one thing we really wanted to work on was the community response. Mm-hmm. So we got a group of community agencies together, child protective services, law enforcement, the schools. Um, Sojourner was part of it. And we came up with some guidelines for kind of how we're going to work together uh, when we have concerns. One of the things that came out of that was a coordinator position through the Milwaukee Child Advocacy Center. Oh, nice. Yeah. So she, it's Rebecca Detman. She's an advocate at the the Milwaukee Child Advocacy Center. Uh, she, if anyone that was, that's part of that multidisciplinary team, law enforcement, CPS, medical providers, if we, uh, identify someone who we have high concerns that they're being trafficked, well, we can call her. Uh, we've worked out some confidentiality issues so that we are able to do that. And then she reaches out to the agencies that need to be involved to help coordinate everybody so we can do a better job at that initial response. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. That's nice. So are you saying that you're getting a lot of people from different agencies, entities to come in at the same time? It depends on the case. They don't mm-hmm. always come at, at the same mm-hmm. time, 
but we are, if they need to be involved, they're contacted early right. on. And that was one thing that we realized when we first started meeting, that that wasn't always happening. Agencies that should be involved in the beginning, uh, they weren't being contacted, they weren't being pulled in, or they weren't getting all of the information that they needed. Right. And so this was our help. attempt to remedy that. Okay. So that kind of helps that person to elevate them with all those resources coming at them. Yeah. Pretty close at the same time. Right. Yeah. yeah. And Rebecca, now she's also, uh, the Department of Children and Families is trying to implement a regional hub system throughout the state. So the state is divided into hubs. Mm -hmm. Milwaukee County is one. And each hub will have a regional specialist who's kind of a point person, uh, specializes in what resources are available in that area for someone who's being trafficked. So Rebecca now is that regional hub specialist. Oh, wow. So really, any professional that is seeing uh, a youth in particular with concerns for trafficking, if they don't know what, what to do, they can call her and she can help kind of walk them through the process. Oh, that's good to know. Mm -hmm. That kind of streamlines, streamlines everything for mm -hmm. the physician right. and makes it easier for them right. to help their patient. Right, right. And there are confidentiality issues. They can't always, you know, they can't tell her always who the patient is, but they can, they can ask, you know, what sort of resources should I be providing? Or gotcha. do I have to report this? What am I mandated to read, to do? And she can kind of help. My goodness. So that. since the, since 2015, kind of when you were doing this study, it looks like things are yeah. changing. The community slowly is changing. Yeah. Slowly but surely. Yeah. Yeah, right. Slowly but surely. Yeah. And, and there are some pretty amazing people out there that are working on it too. One of the things that um, Rebecca Detman also does, which has really helped, I think, coordinate care on an individual level, is we have what's called multidisciplinary team meetings that they're like tele telemeetings where mm -hmm. uh, people, there's it's a collaborative agreement because of confidentiality, but we will have uh, people from Milwaukee Public Schools, law enforcement, the DA's office, medical, all on the same call, and we will discuss what the patient's needs are at that time. So from a legal standpoint, from a school standpoint, from a medical standpoint, we can all give our recommendations and our suggestions or what their needs are, and Rebecca will coordinate that and make sure that all those things get taken care of. All right. If you're listening and or watching and you have some questions or some suggestions or comments, please, you know, send them our way because we would like to hear from you. We want you to be part of this conversation. It is nice that they're doing all of that, what you were mentioning, having all these people mm -hmm. on, on the call line. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, people, agencies kind of work in silos a yeah. lot of times. Mm -hmm. And you miss a lot of things when you do that. Right. But with everybody coming in at one time and hearing the same thing mm -hmm. um, at the same time, things can work a little faster, I would think. Yeah, that was kind of the hope that yeah. it, it would be a quicker way to get information that you need to help that youth. Yeah, because when they're in, when they're in crisis, they're in crisis now. Right. Yeah. So has this, all of this that you've been doing, do you find it rewarding? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. I think when you can see small successes, um, somebody finishing school mm. or going on to a job or getting out of a bad situation or maybe just even staying put for a while, those are all small successes are very important. Yeah. Huge. Huge. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, ladies. Thank you mm -hmm. both for joining us. Uh, this has been an interesting conversation, and I'm really, really happy to see things are changing and evolving in this area with physicians because they play a vital role. You know, we, we kind of trust our physicians. So um, they're kind of the first line of defense in many cases. So this is good news. Uh, we want to thank you for joining us as well. We've talked a lot. Um, Dr. Rabbit, Dr. Ehrman, they have much, much more to talk about. So we're going to have a part two with these ladies, and we hope that you will join us for that because they are involved in a, a new prog program that focuses more on the adults in all of this. 
So this will be very interesting to hear about it. I also want to remind you that the 411 Live is a nonprofit organization. We depend on your support. So we're asking you to please support us. Go to our website, the411live.org. You can see how you can support us. You can find out about previous podcasts and get more information about this one. We are a little bit of everywhere now. I am happy to report that we are now on iHeartRadio Podcasts. So that's a new addition to our arsenal. You can also find us on the YouTube channel, Twitter, Facebook. We want to also thank you for your encouragement. We have received them, we appreciate them, and they mean a lot. Again, this is the 411 Live. Real people, real talk. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.